This is the third in our Spring 2017 Office for the Advancement of Research book talk series, and this one is featuring our very own Associate Professor of Music, Ben Bierman, uh, and his band. I, uh, I'd like to give uh, our Chair of Art and Music, Ben Lapidus, the opportunity to uh, introduce Ben. Ben, introducing Ben. Uh, as I think he knows uh, Ben's work and expertise a little bit better than I do, but uh, thank you all for coming and uh, please enjoy, Ben. Oh, this one's on, okay. Is this mic on? Oh, yeah. Barely. Maybe it could be a little louder so I don't have to get too close. Okay, well, you know, usually at these types of things, people, that you list the degrees uh, that, the, that the person has and their position and all that. So I will do that in a moment, but you know, there's a there's a saying, not just the University of uh, of the Academia, the Ivory Tower. There's also UCLA, the University, the corner of Lexington Avenue, um, which I hold in high esteem, and uh, and especially uh, I, I grew up about 50 blocks north of here, and definitely um, the University of the Streets uh, uh, and the popular music really uh, really valuable amongst musicians. Uh, really valuable. So Ben Bierman is a is a is a master of that school and a master of of the uh, academy as well. He's a composer. He is a scholar. He is a great musician. Um, he has played with so many people who are on this flyer here. I think there are a couple of people that that are heroes of mine that he that, that were left off. Oscar Hernandez, and I think Johnny Pacheco is not on here. Um, Iris Chacon also, <laughs> for those of you who might know who Iris Chacon is, Ben played with her too. Nobody knows who Iris Chacon is in here, wow. Okay, a great important uh, singer, uh, vedette if you will. Um, and uh, Ben uh, has been very active in uh, the music scene here in New York City, uh, Hawaii, California, uh, elsewhere. Um, there are a lot of things I, I learned from Ben about music that um, uh, in the short time that we've uh, really gotten to know each other since he's come here, that have been uh, really um, interesting, uh, profound historical um, data and uh, personal stories about uh, different musicians. Th that kind of information is in this book, uh, which is really interesting because w normally when you um, have a book about jazz and you're trying to teach people about jazz, it's really um, staid and a little bit boring and it's not necessarily based on a person's experience playing the music, listening to the music, and loving the music. And I think that's one of the things that's so um, great about this book is that love and that combination of experience as a musician and uh, as a scholar just comes right through the writing. Very accessible, very practical, um, and uh, all about listening to the music. So uh, it's, a, it's a real accomplishment uh, for him that uh, that this book is with Oxford, I think it's a, a huge statement. And um, the last thing I'll say is, uh, you know, as a musician, we're constantly trying to improve ourselves and improve our abilities and improve our our understanding of the music. And I think that's uh, even though Ben has written this book, he's already working on another book right now, and uh, it's going to be. Uh, something special as well and and in the process of writing these books there's a certain amount of learning that goes on so that is to say that we're always going to be students as much as we are professors and players and so forth so uh, and that's something that is uh, really uh, fantastic about Ben uh, he's constantly learning things and also uh, telling me what he's learning and pushing me to learn some things too so without further ado Professor Benjamin Bierman I don't have to say anything now. <laughs> Could you turn it up, please? I don't want to be too close to it. You don't have a sound guy I just don't want to have to go right into it. Great. That's okay. Imagine the scene. It's Saturday night at a dance club packed with people. They're all dressed in stylish, maybe even outlandish clothes. The music is vibrant pulsing and exciting, inspiring each dancer to outdance the next person. You can barely move on the dance floor, yet the dancers are almost acrobatic. 
The music drives on and on, taking the crowd to new heights. All of a sudden, the band breaks it down, plays a slow, sexy song, letting the energy in the club vibrate and sizzle. The dancers relaxing into a sensual groove while also anticipating the next driving beat. The band lives up to the expectations, cranking it up and slamming the dancers with a driving and relentless tempo. The dancers drive the band, and the band drives the dancers on. And this amazing symbiotic energy builds and builds until the dancers in the band can hardly stand it. The set comes to a dynamic conclusion and, exhausted and energized, the band and the dancers both feel both disappointment and relief. While the dancers in the band both need a rest and a trip to the bar or their tables is welcome, the dancers can't wait for the next set to begin. Now this could be any Saturday night with any band during almost any era. But in this case, the band is a jazz big band and the year is 1938. Most of you, if you had been a young adult at this time, would have been a jazz fan and you would have been at this club dancing to a music that is currently maybe quite unfamiliar to you. You probably can't imagine why you would dance to jazz. Perhaps you have heard very little of it, or maybe you have never heard a jazz performance. So these are the kind of things that I'm trying to kind of introduce, trying to get to, to introduce to people who maybe aren't very familiar with jazz. Um, it's not called history of jazz. It's called listening to jazz. And that's the primary goal of the book, is to try and help. Come on in. Got a, one of our music classes coming in, which I really appreciate. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm trying to help people learn to listen to jazz through this book, uh, largely through the, through the idea of paying closer attention than you're used to doing. We all listen to music all the time. We listen constantly. It's always going on. You have it in your headphones all the time. We don't live without music anyway. We can hardly get away from music. But we don't always listen to it as carefully as we could. That's fine sometimes, but sometimes you want to, you know, you want to get into it. And jazz is maybe a little more, a little more, seems to be a little more difficult for people at this point in time. It's not a popular music. It has a very small share of the music business. But it's a wonderful, vibrant, growing music, exciting music that's just alive, changing all the time. And you just need to, you know, it could be that you need a little bit more education with this music than with some, that you're, with some of the types that you're more used to hearing. So that's, what this is, that's the main point of this book. But also, I give a comprehensive history of jazz, including all the important players, the important compositions, the important recordings, to the whole history of jazz. Um, I also situate in the book, I situate the music historically, because you want some kind of context for what's going on in the world. Music doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, some things were important to me in this book, particularly that weren't done in other books, which is to uh, increase the representation of women in the jazz field. It's been a, a big issue, and also, um, uh, Afro-Caribbean influence in the musicians and the music, that very powerful influence is something that kind of gets shunted to the side. People don't really um, know about. Um, so those are, th those are a couple of things that were unique to this book. Another is that I cover contemporary jazz, which, is, uh, which often has a lot of relationships to popular music, which, uh, which can be helpful to students because there are some elements of popular music. There always have been, but now you know, things are always changing. But the contemporary scene is very vibrant and often gets overlooked. So those are kind of some basic things about the book. It's organized, I got a chapter per week of the semester. I have periodic historical overviews. Um, and then I get these detailed listening guides with timing. So you can, you can listen to the piece and follow the timing along. And I give commentary as the piece goes along in a few different areas. Throughout the book, I use the same types, I look at the same qualities in music throughout the entire book. I look at style, melody and harmony, form, rhythm, and accompaniment. So by the time you get through the book, you've been kind of inundated with information about all these various aspects of the music. I also have less detailed listening focuses. Um, I have little sections on important musicians. I have extra sections on performance issues. Like Ben was saying, it's very important to me that 
um, that people get an inside look, because I think these are the things that will help people kind of relate to the music a little more, to humanize musicians, humanize who we are. I've got some people right here we'll introduce in a minute, and also some friends in the audience. Um, you know, we're really hardworking people. Musicians, you know, people kind of think that, well, they romanticize it a little bit at times, you know, um, and really don't have an understanding of the things that we go through throughout our lives to be able to do this and to do it well. So I try and, I try and bring those issues out in the books, in the book as well. Um, also, there's a lot of controversies and questions that, that arise as we talk about these things, and I, and I cover those as well. I um, thought maybe I'd read, read a couple. Just, just as some examples. Um, then we're we're going to get some music. We're going to play some music. I'm going to make you work. You, have, you all have sheets on your, on your chairs. I'm going to make you all work. I'm going to get you so you, ideally, you're going to maybe learn a little something. And I will too, because I want to know if these things work for you. Um, ben was mentioning, uh, I'm going I'm just in the er very early stages of a new book project, listening to jazz composition. And my thought is that the difficult part of jazz for people often, people will say, oh yeah, I, I like jazz. Um, I, or I want to like jazz, but it's hard for me. I don't quite, I don't quite get it. I, I like it when they start at the beginning, they all play together, and then they do all this stuff and I don't know what they're doing and I get lost, and then I like it at the end again because they all play together. Um, does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> Raise your hand if that sounds familiar. Okay, a few of you. Um, I get it all the time. I, go, I got it last night. I, just, just a few nights ago I got it. My girlfriend, when we, were, when we were listening to music, she said the exact same thing. We get it all, it's, it's very common. Um, so, we're going to do some exercises that are going to make you listen a little more closely so when we're doing that stuff, you won't get as lost. You'll understand a little more of what's going on. So it'll make you work a little bit. Um, but like for example, I, this, when I'm not giving a detailed thing, I try and, what's interesting to me is to try and find the essence of a piece and just lay it out very simply so someone has something to listen for. Um, and this, this is a song called Traveling Blues by a wonderful pianist, 1924, Lovey Austin, her blues serenaders. So I say, um, Traveling Blues is an excellent example of Lovey Austin's skills as a powerful accompanist and thoughtful and skillful band leader. She has created an interesting form and a piece that is exciting throughout. Her full sound, commanding rolling bass in her left hand, an authoritative right hand, and her attention to detail regarding her place in the ensemble in support of the trumpet and clarinet help us to understand why she was an in-demand accompanist and music director both for blues artists and for a wide variety of other acts. Certainly her skills and the music she produced are worthy of much wider note than has been the case in much of written jazz history. And then I give a little thing, a little highlight, something to listen for along those lines, those categories that I mentioned before. Here, form, and I tell the form. Traveling blues is an unusual hybrid form in two main sections. First half consists of five choruses, that means separate sections, and I give timing so you can follow it. And the second half is more complicated and consists of five 60 measure phrases. So the instructor has something that he, can, he or she can talk to you about and um, gives you something to concentrate on. Now, um, you know, I, I mentioned I, that start, starting a new book, but the life of a musician is pretty complicated. Uh, not, I don't know if complicated is quite the right, right word, but we all do lots of things. Um, I'll introduce Tony Ragusas over here on piano. How about a nice hand for Tony? Um, thanks for coming, Tony. Um, I, I, I came to academia very late in life, um, and I spent 35 years as a freelance trumpet player playing with Mike Morreale, who teaches at the College of Staten Island and um, plays with all of us. Um, <laughs> he, run, he, he's, he runs the music program at the College of Staten Island. Um, but I did that for most of my, most of my adult life. And um, we, all, we all have. 
and it includes many things. For example, I was a sideman trumpet player, but I also have been a band leader. Whenever I want to hire, I need to hire a piano player. I can't. I just want to call Tony first thing because he can do anything, any song, any style. Doesn't matter. I don't have to worry about Tony. I don't have to worry that, that I have to bring any music for him. I don't have to worry that he's going to be late. I don't have to worry about anything, right? And this is a hard-won skill. How, how long have you been doing this, Tony? 45 years. Okay, so, so you know, people think of the kind of respect in society. Who, who gets respect in society? Usually it's, often it's because of how much money you make or whether you have some kind of, you know, societal position. We don't have much societal position. You know, we're not really very, very highly thought of in, in a lot of ways. We certainly aren't compensated very well. Um, but, so 45 years. If he, if he was a lawyer, he'd be, he'd be owning his own firm. You know, if he was a doctor, he'd, he'd be the head, head of the cardiac unit, you know. So, um, anyway, somebody, it, the skills that he has gained over all the years are invaluable. How about David Dunaway? Give him a hand. David Dunaway on bass. Um, just that I, I've known, known David quite a while. But I've known of him for a very long time. We went to the same high school a few years apart, but that's not how I knew him. I knew him from a group he was playing with. We're both from San Francisco. He's from the Mission District, and I'm from the Haight-Ashbury. Never the twain shall meet. He was playing stuff on Mission Street. I was playing, I was playing the blues on Hay Street, and he was playing whatever he was playing on Mission. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, I don't know what kind of music you were playing over there in that neighborhood, but I do know that he was playing with this group called Mel, Mel, was it called Just Listen or Mel Martin and Listen? Featuring Mel Martin. Listen, featuring Mel Martin. And I was, I, I don't know, I think it was, what was that, like early 70s? Mid 70s. Yeah, or mid, mid 70s. And I remember watching him with that group. I didn't know him. I said, wow, that bass player is incredible. And he was a kid. He, we, you know, we were young back then. Um, <laughs> we still are. <laughs> um, but I remember him. And, um, David also can do anything, anything, and um, but what always what always I've always noticed about David is that he's always listening, hard, hard, and and the would you say that's something you concentrate on, David? Would you say that you, that's something you concentrate on? Yeah. Instantaneously to what I hear, and I can actually go so far as to anticipate, which is what we, we try to get to the point where we anticipate where it's going to go. Yeah. I mean, I, I, because I, if I'm leading a band, the rhythm section is always playing all the time. As a trumpet player, I'm playing sometimes, and as a band leader, I'm like trying to got my mind on a million things. But every time I look at look at David, I just see him just so into the music, something I've really appreciated. And Benjamin Lapidus, um, Ben Lapidus, who's, I'm so fortunate to have him as a colleague here. We, um, we have a great time here at John Jay together. It's, it's, it's a gift, it's, a, it's an incredible gift to have him a, as a colleague. But we also hang out and we play a lot of music together. And um, Ben plays all, all different kinds of music but has made a career um, a big part of his career as a specialist in Cuban music. And uh, he's got this double guitar, got a guitar and a, and a today song here, it's a Cuban thing. And um, uh, we're for, fortunate to have him here and hanging out with us today. Um, I kind of I jumped ahead with that, but what I, what I was getting at was that we do lots of different things, we do a lot of different things, and the same is true for me in my scholarship. You know, I'm a composer, I'm a trumpet player, that's what I was first. When I got to academia late in life, I didn't get, an, I didn't get a master's until I was in my late 40s and I got my PhD at the Grad Center in my 50s. Um, and my, so my world as a musician is completely informs everything I do as a scholar. And that's the one thing that I have that's special about me, I think, that allows me to stand out for you know, a little something in my writing that stands out because I have 
that insider's, a real insider's viewpoint from long, long, hard years of traveling, playing, and working, and studying. But my writing, I also have a whole scholarly life. I'm, I'm a, I, I work in a cross-disciplinary way with music theory, musicology, um, <clears throat> ethnomusicology. I use all these things along with my musicianship as a trumpet player and a composer and really a multi-instrumentalist. Um, so all that goes into this. And I found, I have, I've written up a lot of peer review articles and, and chapters and books and all that kind of stuff. And it's so rarefied, my world is the scholarly world of jazz scholarship is tiny. You know, my friends don't even see what I'm writing unless I send it to them, you know, because it's a little tiny, tiny, tiny world. And I, I'm getting tired of that. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, it's kind of, kind of a drag, you know. And um, this book is actually selling. My buddy Michael is using it. You still using it, Michael? Good. <laughs> uh, John, John's using it. Um, a lot of people, it's being used all, all around the country. And um, also, friends, and I have books for sale for my price. Um, I got them for 40 bucks. You can give me 40 bucks if you want a book, and that's no profit. It's, Pure uh, just my price. I also have a bunch of CDs. My CD, my last CD over there, they're free. So as you're going out, please take a, a CD if you'd like. There's a, there's a bunch there, probably enough for almost everybody. Um, but I have really enjoyed, so friends and family and all kinds of people have bought the book outside of being a textbook, and they like it as a reference. They like it as something like an encyclopedia kind of. They're listening to something, they look it up, and sure enough, I talked about it or I spoke about the artist. So it's got value beyond just being a textbook. And my next book is actually going to be in the realm of public scholarship because I'm really enjoying that. And the ideas I'll be talking about in the book will be talking about jazz composition, um, kind of in a similar way as what we're going to do now, some of the exercises we're going to do. Finding a way that you can grab onto things and understand the music a little better. That's the idea. So, I've introduced everybody. We're gonna, um, I want you all to get out like a pen or a pencil or something and get that sheet going. And if you don't have a pen or pencil, use your phone because I'm gonna call on you. And um, students, um, I might call on you, but faculty, I, you know, I'm, you're, not, you're not safe. Matter of fact, you're in, you're in grave danger. Um, so, um, one of the crucial styles of music involved in jazz is a wide genre, but the blues is very important. If you're a jazz musician and you can't play the blues, it, that's not good. It's not good. You know, you, you, really, you really need to be able, you really need to understand that. You need to be able to understand that music and understand it well and speak that language. That doesn't mean there's only one way to play it. There's all kinds of ways to play it. You'll hear, we'll all play it differently. And um, I told my friend to bring his horn. Why don't you bring your horn, Mike? <laughs> so um, uh, we, we're going to, uh, what I want to, first thing I want to do is talk about the, the form in the blues. And that's largely what I'm going to make you try and figure out. Now, the blues is very simple. Well, in some ways, it's 12 bars, okay? It's divided into 12 bars. Each bar has four beats. Um, I'm gonna, so what we're going to do is, right now, I'm going to have, have them play. We're going to play two times through. We call each time through a form a chorus. So they're going to play a chorus, and I'm going I'm to count the beats, okay? And I'm going to count the measures. And once I get going, I want you to join me. And then we're going to do the second chorus, and I'm going to stop, and you're going to keep going, okay? So you're going to count the second chorus by yourself, okay? And if you, if you don't get to 12 or you got beyond 12, you did something wrong. Right. But I, I think we'll work it out. So blues and F, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two. let me hear it. Four, two, three, four, five, two, six, seven, eight, nine, two, three, four, ten, two, three, four, 11, 2, 3, 4, 12. You got it. Come on. 1, 
Okay, good, good, very good. Okay, now we're going to play. Um, we're going to play the blues, and uh, you're going to have to tell me at the end how many choruses we played. Okay, now, but you did just then. That was pretty easy, right? Pretty easy. Oh, before I, before I do this, we got. I got to show you a, a couple of things. One is, let's do it again. David, mix up two and four. The bass, the bass does play, can play a lot of different ways, but two of the main techniques is when the bass plays, we have four beats, one, two, three, four. Sometimes the bass will play on one and three, just two beats per bar, and sometimes they'll play on one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That's it, two. Play a four. One, two, three, four. Back in two. Two, one, two. Okay, great. Good. So um, you are going to. And one more thing. You got. You can be listening for a lot of things. A very important element. In, in jazz in general, but also um, particularly in the blues and, and some styles are, they're often made up of riffs, little lines, little repeated lines. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show you what a riff is. One, two, It's just a repeated thing, right? And it kind of goes over the chords. Well, it does. It, sometimes it'll change a little bit. Sometimes it won't. So, what are you supposed to do? By the end, I gave you this sheet. By the end, I want you to tell me how many choruses we played. Okay. Now, what does that mean? You're going to be kind of that 12 bars, and you're going to remember. You know, maybe make a little mark for each one. So, by the it means you have to be listening the whole time. Now, that's unusual. Can, I mean, think about that. How often do you do that? Do you ever do that? Not really. Usually you're doing something else, right? Usually you, you're, you know, you're looking at your phone, you're, you're watching TV, uh, who, knows what you're, you're walk, you know, who knows what you're doing. When your earphones are on, you're not listening half the time. I'm not saying that's bad, but it's true, right? So now you're going to be listening for that, but I want you to listen for more. I want you to make a note of what choruses David plays in four and what choruses he plays in two. Okay, so that's another thing that you have to watch out for. And I want you to um, tell me also which choruses I play primarily riffs. Okay, some of, some of it I'm gonna do as riffing, playing riffs, and some of it I'm not. So you're gonna try and figure that out too. So it's a lot of information. Right? So you're going to have to listen closely, and, um, and by the end, hopefully you'll have... And also, I forget what I wrote on the paper, but I think I also gave you space just to make some notes. What do you notice? What's, what steps out to you? What's so funny? Yeah. Pardon me? Of course, it's 12 measures. So one time through the blues, one time through that, is called a chorus. So when we played, Use the mic. you counted one, Use the mic. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That was one chorus, uh, and then you start over again. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. Too complicated for you? Um, I'll dance. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to reiterate: count how many, how many, how many choruses we play. Okay, when David is playing in two and four, when I'm playing in riffs, and Anything else you notice that, that kind of jumps out at you? Because you're going to be listening, so something might come up to you. All right? So we're going to bring it for us up front.
How'd you do? What'd you get? How many choruses? You didn't count. What'd you get, Evan? How many choruses? I, I knew you were gonna do this. <laughs> and I just want to explain how embarrassing this is gonna be when I get this wrong. I used to play jazz. I read his book, which he undersold. It's really, really amazing. And I've listened to his CD about a hundred times. <laughs> and he undersold it. So I didn't lose count. I did pay attention to the twos and fours. He alternated okay. uh, two, he did two choruses of each, so he was doing odd and even. You came in, you played the head in the second chorus, and then you started to improvise. You played two choruses of fours between the trumpet and the bass. I thought you played 12 choruses. Uh, I thought, play, I thought, I thought I was, we played I played 12, okay. I, I asked him a simple question, look what I got. <laughs> I just wanted okay. to know, but I actually allowed myself to enjoy it. Really. Okay, good, <laughs> good. I, well, it, that's true. That, that sometimes can get in the way, all right. So, okay, thanks. How many courses did you get? You said 12, you said yes, so I agree. No, I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't counting. You, you weren't counting. What'd you get, Allison? You got 12, Thalia? What'd you get? I, I was just having a ball. Okay. <laughs> John, how many did you get? How many? Yeah. So how many did you think? I'm thinking 13. thought 13. Yeah. What'd you get? 13 you got? 14. 14? Is this Price is Right rules, 11? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember that game anymore. But, but 11 you said? Okay. You got 11. Anybody get something different? I've heard, I've heard 12, 11, 14, 13. What'd you get? Oh, I started counting about eight. You started counting about eight. What'd you get? What? What'd you get? Twelve. Twelve. You got a lot. Got a lot of twelves. What'd you get? You looked like you were working hard. What? Thirteen. What'd you get, Mike? <laughs> it was thirteen. It was thirteen. Um, lucky thirteen. But you know, if you if you got if you got something else, at least you tried. You know, serious, seriously, no. No, I'm serious because you, you were listening harder than you're used to listening. Would you say that's true or not? Yeah, so you were listening. Okay, now, um, somebody I didn't ask, did you, see, did you see when the bass played in two and four? Did you pay attention? No, she was listening. <laughs> you were just enjoying it. How about you? Did you write down? I got lost. You got lost. Anybody feel confident about the twos and the fours? Yeah, what'd you get? When, when was, like, what choruses did you write? Which choruses he was playing in, in two and four? First three choruses in two and four. Fourth and fifth and four. Then chorus in two. I mean, six chorus in three. Seventh chorus in four. Eighth chorus in two. Ninth chorus in four. Ten and eleven chorus in three. Twelve chorus in two. First three chorus in four. Okay, so you were really paying attention. <laughs> he, he got 13. And he, and he you know, I, I didn't exactly keep, keep track, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, I know what we did it, but I, I'm assuming you're right because you were, you were, you were listening. Um, so that's, that's good. He gets an A. Actually, you all do because you, because you did it. And, and that's, that's the idea is that, you know, the more conscious you are, the more little pieces of information you have, the easier it is to follow and to get into something like this. Um, because, you know, we played, I played, um, I played, they played an introduction. I played a melody, a riff melody for two choruses, that's three. I played two choruses of, of a solo. One of them was a riff. And then the, he played a couple choruses, he played a couple choruses, he and I traded back and forth four bars, which is a very common thing as, as well. And other times, you know, you might have been a lot more lost. You know, be, this way at least you were, you know, you were, you were listening on a little bit of a deeper level. So, mission accomplished in that respect. Um, we're gonna do another one. Am I doing on time? Good. We're gonna do another one. Um, we have a, a form, the blues is a very important form in jazz, 12 bar blues. Not all blues are 12 bars, but that's the most common. We also have a very common song form called AABA. Music students in the back, have you guys been talking about that yet? Gregory, have you talked about that at all yet? Professor Shepard, is he gone? 
<laughs> At least he brought his class. That's good enough for me. Um, so AABA is a, is a very standard song form, and I have it up here. Um, eight bars. Each one is eight bars, right? A section is eight bars. A section is eight bars. B section is eight bars. And A section is eight bars again. So we're going we're gonna to play it now. The I Got Rhythm is by George Gershwin, lyrics by his brother Ira Gershwin. And I'm going to play... We, Jazz musicians take this song and do it lots of different ways, put lots of melodies on it. I'm going to do the simple one, the regular melody, and you're going to, you're going to follow. You don't have to, just, I think you, you just listen. You're going to hear it, and you're going, to feel these, you're going to feel these eight bars, and that melody repeats, and then B has a different melody, okay? And also the chords are different. What these guys are doing is different. So I'm going to experiment on you. You're going to get to hear it this way the first time through. Then we're going to stop. I'm going to do it again. We're going to play. Kind of, we're all going to kind of go back and forth. I'm going to mix the form up. So it's not going to be A, A, B, A. It could be anything. It could be A, B, A, B, 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 A. I, I don't know. You know. I do know, but I'm not telling. Um, so, and you, and this, this is actually much harder, I think, than the other one. Because I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to keep playing the melody. You're going to have to get the, the character of the sound. See if you can get the character of the sound of each section. So it's a little trickier. It's kind of an experiment to see, um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. kind of mix it up here and you're going to write down whether you're hearing A or whether you're hearing B and then just like you did last time you're going to kind of read back what you got. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen. We're doing thirteen, <coughs> 13 sections. Okay, she's chicken, she's scared. That's where she's going. <laughs> um, so um, you don't have to worry about that. So you should have 13 by the end. Okay, you should have 13. And just write down A or B, okay? And um, gonna kinda, we're going to kind of pass it around. Um, I'll play two. We'll play two. We'll play two. Oh, we'll figure it out. So here we go. One, two. One, two, three. <laughs>
not sure um, we did it right. We made a mistake, right? Where did we make the mistake? What'd you, okay, let, let's just, um, see, we screwed it up. <laughs> we've, we've actually never tried something like this before. So, any clue? Was it like ridiculously hard? A little bit, right? <laughs> it's, it's, um, we, the B section never gets repeated, and we, um, we, we, we did all kinds of, kind of weird things, but we kind of confused ourselves. Where did we do it? It, w it was at the, um, anybody remember what we did? Well, anyway, let's see what you got. What'd you get? You didn't write it down. Anybody, get, anybody try? Who tried? Yeah, what'd you, what'd you get? So you had one A at the beginning? Yes. Say it again now. <laughs> I, I was going to write these up, but I couldn't hook up to it. Uh, I got A, B, A, B, B, A, B, 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 A, A, B. Okay. Well, nice try. <laughs> really? It is. What about, you look like you're, what'd you get? <laughs> Looks like you got like, stuff written down in your paper. I'm looking to see who's got stuff written down. Did you write anything down? It was a little mixed up. Anybody write it down? Anybody else? Yeah, what'd you get? <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you get? Okay, you got the first four chorus of normal. The first chorus, okay, A, A, B, A. Yeah, first chorus, you got A, A, so first chorus, A, second chorus, A, third chorus, B, fourth, fourth chorus, A. Then the fifth chorus, I think you meant to play B, but somebody started off with A. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's correct. And then what'd you get after that? He caught where we made the mistake, too. Okay, very good. Very good. Are, are you a musician? Oh, okay. Well, that's not even fair. But Mike, he, no, he noticed that we, that we screwed up that first, that first A. Somebody was doing, I think, was, we were, some of us were doing A and some of us were doing B. But you get the idea. You get, you get the, how am, I, how am I doing? All right. So... Um, I'm, I'm going to open up for some questions in a second, but I just want to do one real, real short, quick thing that's um, important to me, which is the I mentioned before the idea of um, the Latin influence in in jazz, Afro Caribbean Latin influence, um, uh, Latino Latino musicians and their their importance to jazz, and um, the importance of their music to jazz, and the incredible blending of the two. So we're just going to um, and you know like. The accompaniment that you've been hearing uh, Tony do, he's, it's a certain kind of, we call it comping, short for accompanying, and he's kind of filling in spaces. In a lot of Latin music, we could do a different thing. Play a Montuna, one, four, five. Boom, ba, dun, dun. So that's a different type of accompaniment. And then, um, Ben, give us a Montuna just in, on, your, on your tres. Same thing, it's, like, it's an accompaniment figure. It's a, it's a Cuban instrument that he has on top there. So, so, so it's, it's a very different type of thing. And then um, let's get it going and listen for how different, you know, you heard David playing in two and four, but now he's going to do something entirely different. One, two, uh, 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 uh. Two, two.
just a little something, just a little something, perk the spirits up and let you relax for a second and not, not think about anything. So, um, yeah, we thought maybe we'd, uh, any questions? Anybody have any, um, any questions? Yes. Uh, I just want to know the second part. What is the name of the song you played, uh, AABA? I, I got rhythm. I got rhythm. George Gershwin, very standard song. We use it all the time in lots, with lots of different melodies. Anything else? Anybody else have anything? What about the last part? That was, didn't really have a name. One, four, five, and C. Oh. That's, the, that's, that's the chords. We played the one chord, the four chord, the five chord, and it was in the key of C. We just made it up. So my question is, what makes that second song a jazz song? Okay, well, that's a good question. Um, it's not. I really, <laughs> um, but the the um, you know where the I, the the two are are really close in a lot of ways, and you know like for one for one thing, we all played improvised solos on it, and there's a certain you know we're we're mixing in a jazz vocabulary with a kind of a typical Latin style, so it's in a way we're bringing together a couple of styles in the way we play our solos. But maybe more importantly, um, it's not exactly answering your question because it's a very good question that I don't, because in a way it's not really jazz, but in a way it is. Um, but the truth is they all influence each, them, they influence each other so much. And actually Ben Lapidus is working on a book that just talks about just this, how this happened in New York, how these two influenced them. But I, the reason I really did it more than, more than to try and claim it as jazz was that to kind of point out the skill set that musicians have to have. Because like David, for example, has to know it's a different thing. There's another, I could have brought a different, I could have hired a different bass player and they might not have really known that style, but David does. He knows all these different styles, right? And so when he, when he goes to a job, he might very well have to do that. Tony's, Tony's playing a wonderful Montuno and he's a, he's a strong jazz player, but he studied this music very hard. So we, we use them all and we're called on them all as musicians. And that's, that's a large part of the story that I'm trying to tell with the book is who we are. You know? And so um, the fact that um, Ben Lapidus is a specialist in this kind of music, but he also is a specialist in jazz. He's, he, he's equally at home in either one. So really it's more that reason that I, that I played it. Long, long answer. That's a good question. Anything else? I have questions for you, um, which is, I think I probably know the answers though. Uh, maybe you'll, you'll raise your hands for me. Uh, I'm gonna ask you which, which task was easier, the, the one on the blues or the one on the rhythm changes? Who thought the one on, blue, on the blues was easier? Raise your hand. Okay, who thought the one on rhythm changes was easier? Okay, now, half of you didn't raise your hands. Does that mean, that, that means, that means you couldn't, that it, they were both really hard? Did you, what about you, how'd you feel about it? You, I was noticing you in the beginning when I was talking, you're paying attention, you're listening. What was it like for you to listen to the music? Well, since, since I used to play trumpet for like five years, I kind of, I could go with it, because like I learned a few uh, songs and stuff. So like I keep up with the beat and the tempo was slower then. And like keeping up with the notes on the trumpet wasn't as easy. So it was like I had to keep the, or the other one was slower, I could keep up with the, no, with the beat on it. Thank you. What about you, young man? What was it like, what was it like listening, trying, trying to figure these things out? <laughs> <laughs> figure me. <laughs> yeah, I, I pass the mic to him. Sure. <laughs> Um, it was it was cool. I don't I don't um, usually pay attention to the music like you mentioned before. So at some point I did tune out listening to the music and just enjoyed it more than looking for the technical aspect of it. But it was what, it was, what good. was it like? Was it challenging? Was that was it because it was hard? Or you just I, I think well mainly because I'm just not used to it. I think if I would have put just a tad bit more, more effort into it, I probably would have been able to do it at least for the first song. Uh, for the I got rhythm, it probably would have been a little bit harder. Um, but yeah, I think, I think with a little bit of effort, I would have been able to pick it up. Okay. Um, we, we actually challenged ourselves because we, you notice we don't have any drums, right? There's no drums here. 
it just they're a hassle. You know, so, so somebody has to haul those things in here. They have to park on 59th Street and haul them in here. And I didn't want to put somebody through that. Um, and so we're ch we challenged ourselves a little bit because we don't have, but we're used to it. We do a lot like this. But we kind of we kind of screwed up that I got rhythm ourselves. So I think it was kind of a hard a hard task for you. Um, but uh, I appreciate you trying very much. You know, and the idea is that. Think about that, and it's not the, the things that I was discussing and the ideas that I'm discussing and the kind of effort I'm talking about, it's not, it doesn't just apply to jazz, right? I also, I haven't taught it for a while, but I also t teach the classical, you know, our Music 101 about the history of classical music, Western classical music, and um, same principles. I, I get you listening, not, I don't point, exact, I don't have you counting 12 bar blues, but I do have you looking at form, and I do have you looking at all these same issues. So really, the, the ideas, the, the kind of things I'm trying to get you to do to listen um, for this music, you can really use for anything. So I would just say, as a final thought, just think about that. Think about taking your listening just a step further. Just a step further, you know. Actually concentrate on it. Find something in it. You're gonna find something different in it than I do. Something's gonna touch you doesn't touch me. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I want to communicate in my next book. I want to show you what touches me as a way of maybe reaching you to find your own, your own little thing that comes out. Because there's so many subtleties in music. There's so many subtle things that add to the joy, add to the joy of listening to music. And you know, all the things you can do in school and all the things you're going to do it all, th all throughout your life. One consistent thing you're going to do throughout your entire life is listen to music, all right? So if you just put a tiny bit more effort into it, you're actually even going to get more enjoyment out of it. I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes. Just, just keep that in mind. And I really appreciate you coming. Again, how about a hand for Tony Ragusas? <laughs> David Dunaway? Ben Lapidus, and I'd, I'd like to um, thank the Office for the Advancement of Research for, uh, I don't think they do textbooks very often, or ever maybe, um, in these talks, so I appreciate that they did that. Um, I appreciate that they um, allowed me to do this and come sp speak with you and bring my friends to come play, so thank you very much. Um, just a little shout out to some of the, any faculty that's here too, um, that, uh, Office of Advance for the Advancement of Research is doing a lot of cool things, and one thing they have is this funded research program that I just, I'm trying to get money to write my next book, and they have a, we've had a wonderful program through the entire year trying to help us learn how to do these grants. So I just a little couple shout outs to, um, to OAR there, and um, thank you very much for coming, everybody, and I really appreciate it, and listen, listen to jazz.